put together a pamphlet, a publication, or? Yeah, apparently what had happened was um, the Catskill Mountain Quilters Guild does works every Monday in, in the Herb Center. Right. So through them, and Nancy Smith was is the past president of, of the Quilters mm -hmm. whole thing. So I guess we found out through them, I have only been there since June. Mm -hmm that they were looking to upgrade the exhibit, that they, the traveling mm -hmm. exhibit that they have on the Hall of Famer. And I think that what happened is we misconstrued what it was that they wanted. What they wanted was a traveling exhibit that kind of looked like a, a large book, almost like a poster rack that you could flip through and it was easily transportable. We, we applied for a publication, which I think is going to be great anyway. So we got funded for it. So now I'm interviewing, interviewing all of the Hall of Famers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to do a publication. Now, my, the focus that I want to take in this, and you can tell me what you think of that, is um, I want to talk about the part that quilting plays in the lives of the women who quilt, rather than talk about, you know, this is this kind of pattern, mm -hmm. and this is what you can do with right. it. Okay. I'm going to talk about that. Because that makes it more universal. Yeah, and also, appeal, I think. for me, I'm, I'm more interested in people as a folklorist than I am in objects, mm -hmm. really. I mean, I think have you read any of the books that, that hit this point, that have been published? No, uh-uh. Okay. Well, there are a number of books that have, rather than being how-to books or pattern books, have talked about the quilt and, and, and what they have meant to women uh -huh. in their lives. And there is also a movie, a film called Quilts in mm -hmm. Women's Lives. It's outstanding, yeah. Which is fantastic. I mean, it just yeah. makes you cry and blows I your mind. I was teaching at UCLA a few years ago, and I used that movie. One of the first, if not the first book of this nature, uh -huh. is this one. The Quilters, Women in Domestic Art. Oh, yes. I haven't seen it. And uh, then I read a book recently. What do you think of that phrase, domestic art? <laughs> do you think it's apt? Ye yes, it, in the context of uh -huh. that book, because this is about women, mostly in the, pione the, the, the late pioneer period in Texas and Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So that these women weren't still making quilts because they had to make them. Okay. Okay. They needed them. but. But they were a vehicle for their expression of beauty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a very good article in the New York Times magazine section a number of years ago from which I took some quotes when I was doing a, a lecture on, on quilting. And um, one of the quotes I loved was something like this, that women in the early period quilting days here in this, in this uh, continent, um, women made quilts because they had to, so that their family wouldn't freeze. Mm -hmm. But they made them as beautiful as they could so their hearts wouldn't break. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I mean, yeah. because their lives were so hard mm -hmm. and so difficult, and they were making these of necessity. but. You know, and I guess you could say this about all of the domestic arts. Mm -hmm. You know, why do women make beautiful pies and cutouts on apple pies that are absolutely exquisite? Somebody once taught me how to make a maple leaf cutout and put that on top of the pie. And what, because our nature just looks for ways to express uh -huh. beauty and appreciation of nature. Um, and to bring beauty into our lives. And these women had mm -hmm. lives that were very stark. There's some stories in there about these dust storms. They lived in uh, <coughs> Saudis, mud houses oh, built into that. the side of, of hills. Mm -hmm. And when the dust storms came, you just stayed in. It was, mm -hmm. you know, you just locked yourself in and stayed. And um, they would work on their, their quilts, which would remind them everything was dusty, everything was gray, everything was muddy. It was mm -hmm. awful. But that was a beautiful thing. This <coughs> book is not about quilting, but I seem oh, to recall that. that 
there are some things in here about, I was particularly interested what <coughs> I say about uh, quilting. It, there is some part in here, but I didn't mark the margin or anything. Now, I, I haven't read that book, but I read a review of that book that said, um, that expressed disappointment that pioneer women um, in their diaries talked about domestic activity, which the reviewer yeah. expressed this for. Yeah. What did they he well, expect them to talk about? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But having read the book, what was I would recommend it because yeah. it gives a lot of insight into the uh -huh. into the everyday life. But I was a history major in college with education, but of course I'm fascinated at the extra extraordinary good luck of this author to find these yeah. You know, and to continue a work that her grandmother, there was a grandmother, I believe, um, who had started collecting this stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. And she found it in her aunt in the end. That's wonderful. So the granddaughter ended up putting all together this, you know, well, really g gleaning from this stash of mm -hmm. papers what this book turned out to be. But it was her grandmother who started it. I think that's delightful that it was something carried on. But there are more and more books. There's a new book out called, um, is it I Remember Amanda or something like that. And it's all about um, album quilts that were made by groups and signed and presented and what the circumstances were surrounding them. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All that. So t tell me about you. <laughs> How did you start quilting? Or you could start with? Well, I um, had done many, many other forms of um, crafts, but not, I don't mean paper cutting and that kind of thing. I, I was um, a pretty experienced knitter and cro could crochet and embroidered. I taught needlepoint and cruel embroidery before coming here. Um, I had learned to use a sewing machine as a teenager, but had not really made clothes until after mm -hmm. I graduated from college, and I had reached a certain point of accomplishment in that. I grew up in a uh, as a second generation in a basically Italian immigrant family mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, and um, almost. Everybody, or the majority of the people I knew in my immediate family and also around me because it was also a Jewish neighborhood, mm -hmm. Italians and Jews, were in the garment industry. Mm -hmm. So I was exposed early on to a lot of the terminology and the talk and walking behind my mother and my aunt in fabric stores and they'd say, oh, this feels good, you know, and then I'd go home and I'd right. feel it and I'd learn what good felt like, you know. Uh -huh. People uh -huh. say, how do you pick out good fabrics? I don't know, I have to feel it. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and then you don't know what to tell them to feel. That's right. Um, That's great. And uh, I had, my mother didn't, my mother was trained in fashion design, but she did not work in that. She stayed home to, to raise us. But she had an aunt who didn't have any children who we were very close to. And I remember admiring her ability to whip up a little dress for us in an afternoon without a pattern, you know, mm. zip do. And she was very fond of doing very complicated uh, knitting designs. I have two hand crochet bed spreads that she did, which make people drool. Yeah. That I have two, one that she made for herself and one that she made for my true self. Ooh, and nice. we were still into that. Mm -hmm. She must have made five of these particular bedspreads for girls to have their shoes on. Mm -hmm. And I remember ooing and eyeing and being amazed at the things that she could do. So when we moved to Kingston about 12 years ago, I was into these things of uh, fine, cruel work and needlepoint and all. And I had been previously intrigued by quilting because it kind of fits into the style of home decoration that I like, but I didn't know anybody who quilted because it had not been a part of my culture right. mm -hmm. in growing up, mm -hmm. and I just didn't had not happened on someone who was into it or knew about it. Mm -hmm. We moved here to Kingston, and the first person I met here in town was an elderly lady 
And once she got to know I was interested in, in uh, handcrafts, she said, oh, you've got to meet my neighbor. She's the quilting teacher. Oh. And that was Ruth Culver. Oh. Mm -hmm. And the quilting teacher was Ruth Culver. Right. So uh, I enrolled that fall for her class out of the college. Mm -hmm. And I've been at it ever since. Mm -hmm. That's great. Right. Um, I still do the other thing, you know, the, the knitting and mm -hmm. crocheting, sewing and things. Mm -hmm. So you became an addict, as Ruth Culver. I spoke to her this morning and become addicts. The good ones become addicts. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. And you get, when you're addicted, <laughs> you get very angry about not having the time oh, really? to, oh. to put it. Well, yeah. Um, well, up in, when I started quilting, I had one child and was pregnant for my second. Mm -hmm. uh, three years later, I had a third child, and I remained home as a full-time wife and mother until three years ago when I separated from my husband mm -hmm. and had to go back to work. And I was fortunate to get a teaching position mm -hmm. in a Catholic school. And people have said to me, could you ever go back to being home? Yeah. Because I I call what I used to be a freelance housewife in that um, I was not working full time or even part time at a paying job, mm -hmm. but I was doing a lot more than just being a housewife. Mm -hmm. um, I was involved in quilting. And I was involved in another uh, service organization, a self-help organization, Mother to Mother, uh, supporting women in their breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And I was teaching part-time um, newborn care and physiology and so on for a Lamont's teacher. So I had my fingers in a lot of pies. I loved writing my own schedule mm -hmm. and fitting these things in as I could. And if I wanted to say, for six months, I'm going to put in two hours a day on this new quilt I'm going to do. I could do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't have that option anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't. It's amazing I get done what I do. Yeah. Because there isn't, there isn't the time. Mm -hmm. So, and it wasn't just returning to work. It was also the separation and then the divorce. So it's full-time work, full-time single parenthood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... A few other. I, I'm not. I'm not a person who can't. Who can't. Uh, uh, I'm not a person who can just stay on the home front. I'm always, sometimes to my own detriment, getting involved in things that uh, extend my efforts a little too far. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the way I am. So the quilting has had to take a bit of a back seat. I have not done a full-size quilt since I returned to work. Mm -hmm. uh, and I finished that piece just before returning to work also. That's beautiful. But... It's also an unusual material on the, the on polished the cotton. Yeah. yeah, the polished. And I did... The, it's funny, too, how things have to sit. This little piece here I cut the pieces for that at least seven years ago. Oh, really? And I think last Christmas vacation, I gave myself the gift of sitting down and putting it together. Mm -hmm. In other words, I just said, everything else could go to hell. Mm -hmm. I'm going to finally put this thing mm -hmm. together. So what is it about quilting that's so addictive, if you can put that in words? Well, for me, it's a, medi it's a medium in which I can um, attain the best results for the level of my artistic ability. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I can paint. Mm -hmm. I don't think I have the skill to do that. 
but I have some artistic sense, some sense of color and shape and design particularly. Uh -huh. And quilting gives me just enough leeway, but not too much. Paint is too free. I, I, it's uh -huh. too free for the level of my ability. Mm -hmm. So quilting gives you more parameters, uh -huh. uh, being very geometric, piecing, so that uh, I can have fun with it and let my color sense and my texture sense and design sense work and make something lovely and artistic uh -huh. and satisfy that need within myself. Uh -huh. Because it's just confined enough or free enough a medium for me to right. do that, given my native but, okay. artistic ability. But you're not implying that were you, were you able to paint, quote unquote, able to paint, I might. You would prefer to paint? I, you can't say. Well, I guess I see that as a higher artistic accomplishment, mm -hmm. if, if you want to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, I know very fine artists who have become quilt makers, and I admire their work tremendously. I also envy their real artistic talent. Mm -hmm. because they can see things and visualize things that I don't see. Mm -hmm. um, are we done? Did you call other ones again? Why don't you try them again before you... Okay. Um, <laughs> the geometric has always appealed to me. Uh -huh. um, when I was in junior high school and high school and doodling and art and even in college when we had to take art in the elementary school, I loved the geometric kinds of works and perspective and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, I used to think I'd be an architect. Mm -hmm. And um, planning a quilt, laying out an original design for a quilt is to me like doing an architectural plan. Um, we can talk. This okay. was a big, okay. this was my first original thing. Uh -huh. And um, I did it on a big sheet of um, graph paper, quarter inch graph you, paper. You laid out this whole design? No, in oh. scale, to okay. scale. Okay. okay, like a quarter of an inch with an inch. Okay. okay. Um, so it was a big sheet. Uh -huh. But it was like doing an architectural drawing, and I'd work on it, and then I'd dream about it, and then I'd go back in the morning, and I remember cutting out places with X-Acto knife, and then fitting in a new piece of paper because I got another idea. Uh -huh. um, and uh, it was about a three-week, just the design process and drafting this was a three, and I love that part of it. Uh -huh. That's really exciting. Uh -huh. um, I do, the parts I like least are cutting everything and piecing. Mm -hmm. I love the design part and I love the hand quilting part. Yeah. And I have a quilt, oh it's up in the attic. My second full size quilt was an all white quilt. Mm -hmm. So there's no piecing at all. Mm -hmm. The design is only what's hand quilted in. Mm -hmm. I really love the hand quilting. Uh, and what makes that, it, it's so, I don't know, you're taking a plain space, absolutely simple, it has no texture really beyond the weave of the fabric, and then superimposing something on it that can be very complicated, but the, the, the key ingredient is simplicity itself, a little running stitch. Mm -hmm. but it makes that plain space come come alive because it all bounces out of you, you know. Mm -hmm. After it's been quilted and particularly after you take it out of the frame, it all kind of shrinks up together and, and these places mm -hmm. bounce mm -hmm. out, the designs bounce out. Now each of those plain blue areas is quilted in a different pattern, but it's lost. It kind of is lost unless you have the light on it in a certain way. I think it's beautiful. They're all different. Um, how did you choose your colors, or how do you choose your colors, if that's a, an apt question? Well, choose some them, place them too. Yeah. Um, 
I buy fabric wherever I go. <laughs> I can afford it at the time. Mm -hmm. And depending on how much money I have to spend, I guess it's how much I buy, you know, whether I buy a quarter of a yard or a yard or whatever. So I have quite a, you know, a, a typical quilter's fabric collection, I guess. And I keep it in, the, the bulk of it, mm -hmm. in a three-shelf glass door bookcase. Mm -hmm. Not the oak one, it's a metal one mm -hmm. from an office supply place. Mm -hmm. But you can see the fabrics through the window. Mm -hmm. And it looks real pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have it in a place where people can see it. Um, so your fabric collection or what you see in fabric stores inspire you. You'll see things and you'll say, oh, these go together and they, or they really do something for me. Mm -hmm. And then I will go back and either in the shop or in my own collection pull. Uh, I need this vest. And I had the pattern for this vest for since 1979. Yeah. And I, this is once again, the last week before school started this year, I gave myself the mm -hmm. present of making this mm -hmm. because, I mean, there was a thousand other things I could have, should have been doing. Right. Okay. And I made this. That's well, nice. I decided, you know, like, well, what color do I wear a lot of? I want to wear this and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the navies. And then I built around the pattern also called for a linear print to be mm -hmm. used in this way. So I tried to pick up mm -hmm. that family. Of, uh, mm -hmm. of colors, the roses, and the little mm -hmm. beige, and the blues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, in projects that I've done for other people on order, you have to work from a, an existing color scheme, and then you, you go from there. Mm -hmm. But most of my projects, it's been mostly the color, and then where would they fit later on? Mm -hmm. Not so much with the place in mind, unless it's been... I want a quilt for my bedroom, and these are the colors. You right. Know? Okay. Then you might, you mm -hmm. might do that. Mm -hmm. But most of my projects have not been that way. Mm -hmm. So you're pretty feminist. Yeah, I guess I am. And you, and you see quilting as an expression of that. Mom, you're gonna take me. I have to take you. Why? There's still no answer there. No answer. Keep on calling till you get an answer. Keep on. Um, or walk over there. Um, I don't see quilting necessarily as something that make that is part of the feminist movement. Mm -hmm. I see quilting as an art form that in its time was sometimes used for a feminist statement. The first women's suffrage meetings were held at quilting bees. Oh, is that true? Yes. Oh, I know. Yes. Uh, who was Susan B. Anthony? Is Susan B. Anthony? Yeah. Okay. One of the pe one of the women who was in the forefront uh -huh. of this effort uh -huh. um, of the women's suffragist movement did her first speaking at quilting bees because that's oh. where she could get a captive female audience. Wow. Yes, yeah, somebody, I would follow up on that. Yes, It may be Susan B. Anthony, I'm uh -huh. not sure. Um, and it was a safe area in which women could still express their uniqueness, their artistic talents. I mean, women um, have not, until very recently, and I guess some would argue still, have not reached what they could reach in the art, in the fine art community. Yeah. Okay. And there, is it busy or there's no answer? Okay, why don't you walk up there? I'd appreciate it. To the bullets? No, to the weapons and ask them for the rock. It's four o'clock. Well, hustle. It's five of it. That's what I've got. Um. In the 1870s and into the 1900s, Mary Cassatt, who's one of my favorite mm -hmm. ex impressionist artists, an American mm -hmm. woman artist, she did not get the recognition. She was, you know, kind of like, and, and, and I was amazed when I read about it to find that she was such a close friend with, I think it was Degas, mm -hmm. and, but, but still 
In her life, she was preoccupied with the usual culturally feminine cares, the aged parents, and uh -huh. nieces and nephews, and things like that. Uh -huh. um, so, it was an opportune and, a, and an improved place for women, or vehicle in which women could express their, their artistic uh -huh. side. Uh -huh. um, especially in uh, the dire circumstances or the hard circumstances of, of pioneering and establishing new communities and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But that day at the what I that that day at the uh, ceremony, what I meant was that it just struck me that as the feminist movement and the women's lib movement grew, mm -hmm. so did interest and the in and the exercise of the quilting art grow also. Mm -hmm. And I sort of thought about what what relationship there might be between these two things. Mm -hmm. And I think that women have reached out to quilting as a vehicle of expression the way recently the way they have in the past mm -hmm. um, but also that women continue to want to express the uniqueness of themselves mm -hmm. uh, we have the rights of human beings to attain and be rewarded for everything that we are capable of uh, on an equal basis with men, mm -hmm. but there is still in each one of us a female side and a male side. Mm -hmm. And women should be allowed to express the maleness of themselves, and men should be allowed to express the femaleness of themselves. But because a woman is striving to be allowed to express the maleness of herself, she shouldn't be deprived or feel inferior because she also wants to express the female side of herself, mm -hmm. which is her nurturing, her mothering, mm -hmm. her uh, nest building, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Close the door. Can't, can't you take me? Excuse me. Now, you know, Ruth Culver's exposure to, to quilting has a very deep roots within her own childhood and her upbringing, and you may have gotten some yeah, of that in the conversation. That she had learned when she was five. Right, right. That she was never allowed to quilt, but she was allowed to piece. To piece, yeah. yes. Um, so, and a lot of people, I understand, uh, rejected quilting because they associated it with poverty. Uh -huh. They associated it, people of this generation or a generation before me, like my mother, uh -huh. that age, uh -huh. Ruth's age. Uh, because quilting had gone out, out of vogue. I mean, there was a big revival around the centennial, mm -hmm. and then there came the popularity of the Victorian crazy quilts. And it, one thing I read said that they became popular because quilting per se was looked on, upon as a sign of being poor mm -hmm. or from the lower middle class. And no one could ever accuse someone who was working on a Victorian crazy quilt of quilting because they had to. Oh. They were just making something beautiful and that uh -huh. was much more acceptable. Uh -huh. um, and then kind of quilting went into a slump. but. Quilting of necessity came back with hard times, uh -huh, uh -huh. and it came back during the Depression period. Uh -huh. So, of course, we know a lot of people who lived at that time. And when they got into the 50s and, si 50s and 60s, they didn't want to see a patchwork quilt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. no. And that went out with bowl and pitcher sets and oak uh, uh, towel racks and stands from bathrooms because it was old. Mm -hmm. fashion mm -hmm. and it reminded them of being poor mm -hmm. and they wanted to be have new and not be poor mm -hmm. 
and we do have stories of people who rediscovered their heritage in a new with a new eye and a new appreciation or people who have found stuff that has been packed away because it wasn't worth keeping out yeah mm -hmm. and treasures that have been packed oh, away interesting. I don't know what it is. Huh. Where's, the, where's the color the color stuff is just okay. so here's the plate mm -hmm. here's a runner and here's a detail I mean, this gold thread work is just... Yeah. Now, this is wooden, because this is rigid. Uh-huh. Okay. And you see how they... I mean, this is the Theodora. So it's very Byzantine in flavor, uh -huh. the whole design. Oh, it's coming apart. It's terrible. Wow. Who's this? Who's this? Who's this? I cannot pronounce that name. Oh, God. Gross. Oh, yeah, Rosvita, yes. But look at, and this, this lace netting, this was a technique popular at the time. So they did, this is all cruel. Mm -hmm. Now, this is enlarged. Mm -hmm. So look at the detail. Yeah, you know, they're, they're really. Doing, uh, now, this is a, a quilting type technique. And of course, this is needlepoint, and of course, this looks like the Bayou Tapestries, and this is Eleanor of Aquitaine. Mm -hmm. So, now, where is the... This is Hildegard, and that's my name. Oh, <laughs> that's great. She was a mystic, a great mystic. Let me give you that. Oh, is it yeah, it's all, well, it's going to come apart. I guess there's nothing that can, that can be done about it. So let's see if we can find the one. Here's the, the needle point wow. here. Uh, oh, this is the one with the sampler on it. This uh -huh. is the one that I think has this little notation of, you know, little girls being taught to do this because... A woman has the same wish for self-development as man, the same ideals that she is to be imprisoned in an empty soul over the very window of her cupboard. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a very feminist statement. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can find it. Susan B. Anthony. Oh, this is uh, Mary Wallen's Groff Kelly, uh, uh, Shelley, dying in childbirth with the blood oh, under the ear. Yeah. Oh, let's see. So can it be Leah? Do you have Do you have time for um, needlework? Or is that as time consuming as having someone who does either? Okay, here, Susan B. Anthony. And that's, it's crazy quilted. Uh -huh. And if we can find the information about her, I'll probably tell you why it's crazy quilted. And I think the reason is that she talked at the meeting. But we have to, we have to look at that. And it might be in the other book. Do I do? I knit. I still knit. That went to the, went by the boards for at least a year and a half after I started working. I mean, yeah. I didn't do anything. Uh -huh. Didn't do it because the first year I was, worked. Was that as much time or just that the fact that your life was needle, up in upheaval? Needle, or? Uh, knitting is, is a little bit more mindless. Yeah. You, you follow directions. You don't have to design. You can pick it up and take it with you a lot more easily than you can a quilt, although I've carried them around in big sacks like Santa Claus. <laughs> um, and smaller. I needed at that time, I needed to make something. I needed to create something. Mm -hmm. But it couldn't take a tremendous amount of time mm -hmm. because I didn't have it. Mm -hmm. So I needed a short-term project so I could reach the goal and be reinforced by reaching the goal. Mm -hmm. So I would pick something small. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I needed for my head. Yeah, right. I, I guess that's the only thing aspect of this we hadn't haven't touched. I see this as wonderful therapy, and even better therapy if you can do it in a group. Oh, because you talk about women's self help groups, get a quilting bee together. Yeah, 
Support group. Uh, when we did the bicentennial quilt, I had ne I did not have any experience at a quilting, a quilting bee or anything like that. But we quilted for hours and hours and hours um, around that that frame. Uh huh. And we had uh, the, they ranged in age from 19 to 79. Uh -huh. The people who worked on that quilt. Congratulations. So. Um, we talked about everything, having babies and uh, getting jobs and who you should marry and when and uh, the different jobs we had in our lifetime and gave advice to one another and talked about kids, teenagers who were driving their parents crazy. Uh, we talked about all of those things. Uh -huh. And you leave feeling, at the least you leave feeling unburdened. Uh -huh. You've at least gotten it out. Uh -huh. And if you're really extraordinarily fortunate, you got some good ideas on how to handle it. Uh -huh. So it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Everything with the whisper. I went and um, photographed that today. Yeah, at the college. Right. Um, how did you choose your square? How did you choose your subject for a square? It was mostly by default. Yeah, <laughs> you know, some people had. I, I don't really. It's ten years now. Um, I don't really remember, but um, it had to be done. And you and there's a lot of cool work in my blog yeah. because that was something that I was proficient at, mm -hmm. and I thought I could get more detail in this figure by doing it that mm -hmm. way. So the figure was done separately and then applique right. on the back. And my father was an engineer helping with the perspective. Oh, he did? Because I didn't have any notion of vanishing point. Uh -huh. And he, uh, it's funny. See, you do need this technical, and I guess that's what you get when you go to art school. Uh huh. This aunt that I talked about who could whip up dresses, Yeah. when I was about 10 years old, she did a set of hand-beaded altar cloths for the church. And she designed them herself. But she had no <coughs> formal training and in really hadn't even gone to school beyond the first or second grade. Uh -huh. But she knew she wanted it scalloped, yeah. and she wanted a certain motif and alternating scallops. But she didn't know how to figure how big the scallop should be to be even and cover the length of the altar. And I remember her uh -huh. coming one night and saying to my father, this is how big the altar is, this uh -huh. is how many scallops. How big do they have to be? Uh -huh. And he worked it out with a compass. And my father has done that for me. Uh -huh. uh, that vanishing point business. Uh -huh. And, and uh, oh, the last raffle quilt we did for the guild, we needed a certain motif. But it had to, for that plain blocks, but it had to be enlarged. Uh -huh. And he, to one, two, three, he yeah. could, yeah. <laughs> you know, give me a compass and a ruler, that's all I need. And he uh -huh. did it. Sugar? You take sugar? Oh, no, thank you. I don't even have to call. She's a friend, but you can tell that I'm going to call. I really think that men not having been encouraged in these areas, you know, men, the vehicle through which many men um, met their need to create and to build and to design, given whatever the limits of their talent and creativity were, mm -hmm. they had a lot more options in a more rural society. Yeah. Carpentry. Right. Um, the, all of the things around the home. Mm -hmm. And you can see differences in, in men's objects that they made. Some are more embellished than others because some were more artistic than others. Yeah. But as our society became less and less rural and men on a daily basis were no longer required to be involved in those chores, those necessary tasks, they lost avenues to express themselves creatively. 
Uh -huh. I feel badly for them because they have lost those avenues as vehicles for a therapeutic effect. Uh huh. Uh huh. So oh. there's more. There, there's something more therapeutic about quilting than quilting bees. You don't always quilt in a group. No, no. There's something to be said for. I bet you, for me, it has the results that biofeedback might. Uh -huh. It's a calming activity. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's mindless, and in a way, it's not mindless. Mm -hmm. It's not mindless when you plan it and you design it. But when you're actually sitting down and doing those running stitches, your mind can go a mile a minute. Mm -hmm. But you are made to sit mm -hmm. and to wind down. Mm -hmm. And to be calm. Is there any kind of a, a, a rhythmic? Yes, to it? yes. Yeah. Oh, and many quilters have a very, very pronounced, the most proficient have a very pronounced mm -hmm. rhythm to their work. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing straight stitching, you can be very rhythmic. When you have to go around curves, it's more tedious, so and you can uh -huh. take fewer stitches at a time. So, yeah, I can see that as being very soothing. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so, men have lost avenues for that kind of activity. Mm -hmm. um, now, my son, my oldest son, likes to do needlepoint. He learned Bargello in his art class last year. Oh, really? And it appealed to him. And he wasn't the only one who wanted to continue with it. A friend of his, his mother, tells me that she, too, had to go out and buy more canvas and get some yarn because he wanted to do more things at home. I had the stuff in mm -hmm. the house. Mm -hmm. So I just had to go to the attic and dig it up. But he's 13. We had a garage sale here a few weeks ago and I had some kits that I was going to sell and he said, isn't there something here I can do? And I said, sure. What do you want to do? And he did a little needlepoint, just straight stitches. Mm -hmm. But evidently got great. I mean, he stuck with it and wanted to finish it and did great. finish it. Uh -huh. And I said, you know, don't ever stop doing that or looking on that as something that you can do for fun uh -huh. because it's a great way to relax. Yeah. Rosie Greer does a little bit. Uh huh. She does. But, um. I think that's wonderful. We need. We all, regardless of sex, I, I think, need that time. Mm -hmm. And our lives are just so unreasonably hectic mm -hmm. and demanding mm -hmm. that, um, that we don't, uh, we have to go out of our way, really, to give ourselves those times and experiences, whereas in a more rural society, you didn't have to. Right. Now we're legends in our spare time. Yes, that's <laughs> true. Right. Do you do, um, in terms of your quilting, do you do mostly quote-unquote traditional patterns, or? I started out doing them because I guess I felt safe with them. Uh -huh. And I guess this is a pretty common pattern. People uh -huh. started out with what they saw and learned, learned the medium, mm -hmm. learned how fabric handles and how it reacts, uh, and what you can do with it via very traditional things. Mm -hmm. But most people then, if they feel, to the extent that they feel the urge to do something original, usually move on mm -hmm. and then try to use that medium in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, that large quilt in the living room was my first attempt at doing something original. Mm -hmm. And then the wall hanging is an original but very much influenced by another quilter's work. Oh, really? Does, yeah. that, does that often happen? Oh, yeah. Bit? Oh, yeah. You'll yeah, see a whole, so. a whole um, copycat group of quilts coming out of some... The, true, the really innovative person will do something, and then it'll catch on, and then it will be imitated as traditional quilts are imitated. Right. But, but, once again, when you've seen one log cabin, you can't say you've seen them all. I mean, a log cabin is the most traditional of patterns, 
but we're still making them because the possibilities are endless, yeah. the fabric choices are endless, the the design variations are endless. So it is not necessarily a put down to say that someone has, you know, um, Ginny Byers has come up with a new design and, and you can see all of these quilts influenced by Ginny Byers. Well, who cares? That's oh, fine. Absolutely. That's uh, how we learn things. Right. And, uh, you know, they say this is, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So when these people really enjoy something. Oh. So much pleasure out of my students winning ribbons at oh, shows uh -huh, uh -huh. because, oh, you know, uh -huh. that I really gave them, it, it, they not only learned technique from me, but if I help that enthusiasm to grow in them, and if uh -huh. they're getting anywhere near the pleasure out of that enthusiasm that I am, uh -huh. wow, I've yeah. given them some gift. That's and great. then to see them win a ribbon, uh -huh. yeah, that's, that's so much pleasure out of my students winning ribbons at oh, shows uh -huh, uh -huh. because Oh, you know, uh -huh. that I really gave them, it, it, they not only learned technique from me, but if I help that enthusiasm to grow in them, and if uh -huh. they're getting anywhere near the pleasure out of that enthusiasm that I am, uh -huh. wow, I've yeah. given them some gift. That's and great. then to see them win a ribbon, uh -huh. yeah, that's, that's the, um, uh -huh. the cherry on top. Uh -huh. But... Um, I, I don't know, it. haven't you experienced it yourself when you come on something that really intrigues you, you just kind of want to convert everybody or tell them or somehow let them in on this great new exciting thing and Absolutely. a lot of the time you just don't find anybody who's <laughs> interested. <coughs> I know. Well, the reason that I even, even broached that, asked that copyist question, because so often in, as a folklorist, you find folklorists, particularly older folklorists, um, considering that re the repetitive nature of what they, they call folk art um, as the most important quality. Oh, with, um, I can't think of the word, um, taking away from its artistic quality, because I think that part of any, mm -hmm. any art is, mm -hmm. is rising to a challenge. And there might be a challenge. In, there's a Should I not try in. to use Rembrandt's theory of light in my painting if I so choose because Rembrandt exactly. did it? Exactly. Yeah. And there are people today who are in essence specializing in making traditional quilts of supremely high quality. Mm -hmm. These will be the museum pieces of the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a two-year project. Yeah. And it's not avant-garde, but the workmanship and the color choice mm -hmm. and the design are mm -hmm. splendid. Mm -hmm. And because they're traditional doesn't necessarily mean they're not original. Yeah. It can be in the traditional mode Mm -hmm. But it can still be an original design. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I know, you know, Ruth Culver showed me more things to do with a log cabin pattern than than you ever did. I know. I had no idea. Right. And all of those quilts look quilts look completely different. I said it can't be the same pattern. This isn't true. Yeah. But it is. It is. I would like to do, right now, I, uh, I'm kind of hooked on the Amish tradition. Why is that? Why? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're hooked on geometrics, mm -hmm. the Amish is so starkly geometric mm -hmm. and so simple. Also, most Amish quilts contain large areas of plain fabric, yeah. which lends itself the beauty of the hand quilting oh, uh -huh. and it's solid and your uh -huh. hand quilting does not show much on a print uh -huh. it only shows on a solid mm -hmm. so if you like to hand quilt and you're not particularly uh, enamored of 
doing all that hand piecing, a large Amish quilt could be very few pieces uh -huh, uh -huh. when you sit down and cap them. Uh -huh. um, as many as, let me see if I can think of it, as few as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, oh, wait a minute, four and four and four is twelve, and one is just thirteen pieces. Oh. You can make a whole quilt. Big center square, uh -huh. four triangles, on a set on point, uh -huh. four triangles to fill in the corners, uh -huh. a border strip, uh -huh. border strip, and a corner square. That's four and four and four, mm -hmm. twelve, and the center square is thirteen. And that could be a whole bed, you know, double yeah. bed quilt. Uh -huh. So you have all of this wide expanse. But they do that, they would do that with black, turquoise, and brown. The honest? Yes. Black, turquoise, and brown. Whoa, what a color scheme. <laughs> I can't imagine it. I... But that's what they do. Huh? That's what they do. And they use the turquoises and the reds for what they call sparklers. These are miniatures. Mm -hmm. But these are Amish. Amish. These are Amish style. Okay. Lots of black. Yeah. Oh, they're beautiful. Now this is now this is what you call taking the art form and moving it one step further. This uh -huh. is unlike any Amish quilt that the Amish ever made. Yeah. But you, it's distinctly Amish in style. Mm -hmm. But she's put her own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Flavor into that. But the old Amish, the old Amish quilts, you know, something like this. This might be just turquoise, uh -huh. and then there'd be brown, and gray, and black, uh -huh. and you would have just this one thing bouncing uh -huh. out at you. Uh huh. I see. So you see, if you're really into geometrics and like, you know, the straight lines, but I then look at the quilting, it's all feathered reeds. Oh my goodness, yeah. It's, it's almost contradictory. Yeah. They're beautiful. I could see so many of these things in like the Museum of Modern Art or something. Like oh yeah, oh yeah, brand. absolutely, absolutely. That's amazing. And they also had kind of what I guess in music would be called a dissonant sense because if you look at this little quilt here, all of these, most of these blocks have black in the corners. These are little nine patches. Mm -hmm. But this one and this one have turquoise in the corners. Just these two blocks. Uh -huh. And the author says, if you want to be really Amish, cut, make two that are different and just haphazardly interspersed them. It's like they had a, um, I'm sure they had a, have a good sense of humor. It's like they, they just have a, a kinky sense about putting in this little dissonance to set you uh -huh. off guard, you know? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Not there must mistake. be a visual term for that, because dissonance has to do with the, the sense of hearing. Yeah. <laughs> but visually, something that uh -huh. sets, sets it off. Uh -huh. I'm going to go to uh, class on Friday so I can actually pick up this vocabulary. So, <coughs> do you choose, well, now that you're into this, do you tend to choose patterns out of books? I know that that's not true. I don't know why I'm asking that question. <laughs> two quilts a year, I can answer that question more yeah. precisely. Yeah. Um, I am influenced by what I see in uh -huh. exhibits and in the books, uh -huh. once again, because of my own artistic limitations. I mean, I, you know, I have some artistic sense, but I'm not, um, I mean, I just envy so after you, these quilters, quilters lecture, and then you say, what's your background? And I say, oh, 
I have a degree from Pratt Institute. And I go, oh, that's not fair. You should be doing this because, of course, you know, they just, mm -hmm. the eye of the artist is, you know, amazing, mm -hmm. amazing. And that's why truly amazing quilts were produced by women 100, 200 years ago, because there had to be among those women truly artistic women. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the sense of today they could go to Pratt Institute and be fabulous commercial artists mm -hmm. or um, have their own exhibits. I mean, the sprinkling of that kind of talent genetically we can't say that those women, th there had to be, I mean, by, by chance, the yeah. laws of chance. There had, so those women expressed it. Mm -hmm. And when you look at old quilts, there are old quilts that are, you know, we get them for exhibits. Just because it's 100 years old does not mean it's going to be a beauty. Mm -hmm. Because the person who made it had a very commonplace pedestrian sense of color, mm -hmm. or no sense of color. Mm -hmm. And maybe her technique was lousy, mm -hmm. because there were people whose technique was bad then. Mm -hmm. In fact, the theory is that most of what survived is really good because they were preserved. Yeah. They weren't used every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that the best has survived, and there was a lot of mediocre around, but it fell apart. Mm -hmm. It was used and fell apart. Mm -hmm. And the best, best quilts quilts that were saved for special occasions or for when guests came, yeah. uh, they made it yeah. because they were, they were saved. Mm -hmm. So that's my own particular theory, that, that women who were not, uh, by their circumstances and their culture, permitted to, to um, train or fine-tune their natural gifts, uh, found other ways to express them mm -hmm. and that's why we have some that are truly truly uh, spectacular in colors and design um, but nowadays a lot of women not all but a lot with that inclination have been able to educate it and fine-tune it and to um, and to express it and sell it uh-huh do you um, sell any of yours i've so sold a few, uh -huh. a few things a few things Mostly small work, mm -hmm. because uh, and not my most, my, not my original stuff. Yeah. Um, you have to find the market, and if I had time to pound the pavement in New York, but if you pound the pavement in New York, you have to produce. And it's. Uh, I wish that we had here what uh, they have in some other places, which is which is a co cooperative kind of thing for artisans. Mm -hmm. um, where you pay a fee, you become a member, and then the cooperative markets, and they, they're the middleman for the orders and the contacting and so on. I have uh, my sister's sister-in-law belong to the New Hampshire Artisans League or some such yeah. thing like that, and she, she was, a, she was uh, a trained artist and printer. And she printed in her home and did uh, all kinds of lithography and wine, everything. And um, she had developed in quite a business. And that did not stop her from uh, exhibiting at fairs and things mm -hmm. like that, which she could do, the big, big craft fairs. But she got a lot of her orders through this uh, cooperative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Um, if I had access to that, I might, uh, you know, I've, I've sold a lot of these pieces. Yeah. Okay. But that's not an original design. But the fabric choice is an original design. Because okay. I've seen that done and it looks tacky. Uh, you don't know. But your fabric choices and the colors and so on. Um, and I still sell a few occasionally because people see them at the homes of friends and say, I want one, you know. Uh -huh. They see one and they make them. Like but that's machine applique. Uh -huh. So it, it often comes to the old thing of making stuff for your art and making stuff that will sell. Yeah. Sometimes. I think for women in all of these mm -hmm. 
art forms or, or handcrafts. What they feel is their best work is not necessarily what they can sell. But in order to earn a buck, they make what is not necessarily shoddy, but not necessarily the most original. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, or reflective of their highest level of skill. Or themselves. Or, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. right. Or themselves. Have you ever considered doing, I know that you do, well, it tends to be fabric that you work in. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered other mediums? Well, I, I am intrigued by most of these, yeah. these, um, these crafts. So this, before the fall began, and I was looking at uh, the college brochure, the adult ed from I just decided that it would be a good thing for me to give myself the gift of taking a, a course. Mm -hmm. And the two things that appealed to me, one was uh, uh, a computer program course, and the other thing was wood carving. I'd love to learn oh, how to wood carve. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel it too may have parameters enough for me to feel mm -hmm. You know, maybe I'm not giving myself enough credit artistically. I don't know. Um, but I, th I think that, it, well, I shouldn't be saying this, but I, I think that you're working under an assumption that I don't hold myself, which is that these kinds of arts are not fine arts. Mm -hmm. Whereas, as far as I'm concerned, The process that you go through to create a quilt mm -hmm. or knit a sweater or mm -hmm. do a, some needlework mm -hmm. is the same process that a painter hanging mm -hmm. in the yeah. Museum of Modern Art goes through. Right. Okay. But what I'm saying mm -hmm. is, however, but quilting, unlike most knitting that I do, although there are people who knit, they design their yeah, work. Okay. 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 I don't feel secure enough in this art form or this craft yeah. for me to be that expressive of myself. Mm -hmm. But in quilting, I found a medium, a craft form, mm -hmm. um, uh, construction technique within which I was comfortable enough mm -hmm. in my intelligence <laughs> to then be creative. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. And so the wood carving kind of the same way. Yeah. And they even had a class where you could do it with your child, which I thought was great oh, too. Oh, yeah. But, um, the tools are expensive, <laughs> and it, you know, I made another choice. But uh, I am intrigued. You know, I learned how. To, I taught myself how to do macrame just because I wanted to see what it was like. I didn't continue. It didn't grab me. Yeah. Also, it did not um, lend itself to my scheme of home decoration either. Yeah. Or most of the people that I might make things for and give them to. So I dropped it. But I was just intrigued about. The mechanism, the doing, the medium. Mm -hmm. How does it work? Mm -hmm. See, I before I got into quilting, or someone could teach me, I didn't, I didn't understand how this thing went together. Yeah, I knew enough about sewing, but I didn't quite uh, the layering and that whole business. I just, you know, and now mm -hmm. I explain it as a peanut butter sandwich that you could yeah. sew it together <laughs> through the layers. Uh -huh. um, so there are other. Um, other, you know, art forms that intrigue me. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to know how to, I'd love to do more paper cutting. Mm -hmm. I love the black paper cuts that you see with yeah. crafts and uh -huh. scissors and stuff uh -huh. like that. So, you know, all, all different kinds of things. You probably um, answered this question in, a, in what you said already, but I'm going to ask it. Um, what kinds of rewards do you feel? That you get from quilting, and it can be personal mm. or monetary or mm -hmm. you know. Well, I really get a big charge out of making something beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I get a, I get a big charge, frankly, out of doing something that most people can't do. Mm -hmm. Um, that I have a skill or a talent or whatever to do something that most people mm -hmm. can't. So it's a statement of, I guess, you know, 
my uniqueness in one area. Mm-hmm. Uh, There was another strand of thought there that I just, that I lost. I want to see if I can come up with another question. Uh, it, se- it serves a great therapeutic purpose right. in my own life mm-hmm. <clears throat> because it forces one to sit. Um, when I was a nursing mother and helping nursing mothers, I reminded them that one of the advantages of nursing was that it made you sit down and be with your child and hold it. Mm-hmm. And that given our lifestyle, when you're bottle feeding, the tendency is to give it to someone else to feed or crack right. the bottle. or I, And this makes you, it makes you sit and mm-hmm. take the time to be intimate with your child, Mm -hmm. with your infant, when they are so impressionable and needy of um, sensory stimulus and so on. So this is the kind of thing that makes you sit. Mm -hmm. Okay, for someone else it could be their stamp collection. Yeah. Okay. Right. But it serves that purpose Mm -hmm. in um, in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, What is it? It has given me friends. Oh, really? Absolutely. Two of my dearest friends right now are not avid quilters. They're not terribly skilled, Mm -hmm. but they were students of mine. One was. But I met them through quilting, Mm -hmm. in preparing a show or in teaching a class. Mm Now, I may have met, in both cases, these were women who attended the same church, mm-hmm. year after year after year. Mm-hmm. One I'd seen all the time. I didn't know her name. Mm-hmm. But through quilting, we made contact. Quilting is no longer the principal connection between us. Mm-hmm. But I credit That's great. that involvement as being the, the way through which we met and found mm-hmm. all that we uh, that we have in common. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, a lot of the people who've been most active in the guild and are uh, most avid in their quilting, it seems to me. This may seem very, you know, kind of self-serving, but um, very generous and compassionate people. Yeah. As I said to you before. Um, they're usually very busy people. Mm-hmm. They're they're achieving people. They set goals for themselves, and um, it would seem that their life does not have the time to give to this type of art. But they make the time, mm-hmm. and coincidentally with that, they are usually generous about sharing their talents and their resources with other people. Yeah. And so much of this is just sharing and passing along. Uh, The people I have in mind have often been paid for their teaching, but I'm sure all of them would say, and I found this to be my experience, that we've done at least half of our teaching for free. Mm -hmm. In a little quilting group that we happened to meet with, Mm -hmm. so we were the the local um, expert, you know. Yeah, right. (laughs) Or at guild meetings or with kids on some project. Mm -hmm. I did a quilt, a little quilt with my class last year, second grade, Mm -hmm. and brought the frames to school and we tied it in school. And then we raffled it off and made over $100. It was completely unplanned. Uh Um, So I I think most of the people that I have in mind who've been, uh, who've taught for, for money would also say they taught a great deal without being right. uh, recompensed for that. Right. So uh, making these things, and, and then of course the compliments from other people, it's a big ego mm-hmm. booster, you know, mm-hmm. to, uh, to do that. <coughs> 
I don't know if we're type C, per type C or type A personalities, the prone personality, the high know. blood pressure and oh. cancer. <laughs> they have the types, you know. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh -huh. us people uh -huh. <laughs> who do this are supposed to be type A. Mm -hmm. I think it's type A personalities. <laughs> So do you consider yourself, well, you obviously are you're in the Hall of Fame. Others consider you an excellent quilter. Um, you said, though, that there were people who, whose work, workmanship wasn't all that great. Mm -hmm. Do you really strive for that kind of perfection? Well, don't, don't, don't ever oh. think that <laughs> I think my work is perfect, because yeah. it's not. Okay. I know it's not. You, how do you know it's not? I because I can show you all the places <laughs> where it's not. I, see. Um, I know what my strong points are and I know what my weak points are. And uh -huh. I think my strong point is the hand quilting, right. which is by far not the smallest, not the neatest. But, I uh -huh. mean, it's all relative, you know. Yeah. Okay. There is very, very fine quilting. There is a method of quilting with two thimbles, one on each hand. Oh, my dear. Yeah. And these people literally bounce the needle back and forth off these two thimbles, one underneath and one on top. Oh, my goodness. And their stitches are tiny. They take one at a time, so they're really superb. Uh huh. I've never been able to learn that method. Uh -huh. Incidentally, I never wore a thimble until I quilted. Oh, really? And I did a lot of hand sewing. I did mm -hmm. needlepoint and crewel, and I was told repeatedly by this aunt of mine who was, when I was a little girl and sewing, I never would use a thimble. She said, you'll never be a fine needleworker until you use a thimble. Oh. And I just considered them a nuisance. Well, you either bleed to death or wear a thimble <laughs> if you're going to quilt. Right. Uh, at any rate, I know that my quilting could be better. Mm -hmm. But of the components within the creation of a pieced quilt, mm -hmm. I think my better points are my hand quilting mm -hmm. and and color fabric selection. Okay. I wish I could do more design wise, mm -hmm. better design wise. I'm working on that. Uh -huh. Piecing is my least favorite thing right. to do and right. it shows the greatest amount of errors because I have the least patience with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are um, people within our guild whose work is superb. Yeah. Superb. We have, there's a gal in our guild, Barbara Albestad, who does applique, which has never been my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Her applique is just exquisite. Mm -hmm. Just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I know other people whose piecing is so precise. Just so precise. And there are some professional quilters, the, the big names, you know, that you see in the magazines and get commissioned by IBM to do gigantic things for lobbies and all of that, um, whose, uh, whose work is really very, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have the smarts to know what their weaknesses are so they don't do that part. Yeah. Like Nancy Crow does large, very contemporary design. Mm -hmm. And she she does all the piecing because she pieces as she designs. It's a unified process. Uh -huh. But then she has um, Amish mm -hmm. women in Ohio, a mm -hmm. particular person, or maybe there's a group of women, who quilt them for her. And mm -hmm. she, she lays down the quilting pattern. Right. But they do the quilting. And she makes no bones about the fact. And she gives credit uh -huh. to the quilter uh -huh. by name. <coughs> And I would hope that that quilter gets the financial remuneration yeah, to which right. he is entitled. Uh -huh. um, incidentally, I got from Nancy Crow the address of a woman in Ohio, an Amish woman, who um, is uh, the middleman for handing out this work. So I have sent them work uh -huh. and have had other people send them work. Uh -huh. um, I just recently got a letter from Amanda Miller in Millersburg, Ohio. Wow, that's perfect. Rural route. <laughs> right. Um, about finishing a project that I started and I don't think I'm going to get to. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're willing to uh, 
I have a log cabin quilt in progress. It's been in progress for I won't tell you how many years. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to be a gift for somebody, so I feel terribly guilty about it. Uh -huh. Half the blocks are pieced and half, don't, half aren't, mm -hmm. but they're completely cut. So I said, I'd like you to finish the block, piece the top, tie it, and bind it. Mm -hmm. And I'll provide all the top pieces and the, back, and the binding and backing. You provide the bag. A hundred dollars. Wow. Nothing. No. <laughs> it's just tied. They're not going to quilt it. They're just uh -huh. tied. Uh -huh. Now, wait a minute. The price, I have to go back and look at the letter. <laughs> Did that price me? Did it change? No, no. It was just tied. Because uh -huh. it was intended to be tied with a thick bat. Mm -hmm. But it's wines and blues. Mm, that's <laughs> nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pale, pale roses to the wine and pale blues to Ooh. the navy. <coughs> Very nice. <coughs> so it, it, it will be nice if it ever gets done. And mm -hmm. I think maybe I will have to somewhere, of course money is a problem, dig up the dough because I just can't seem to get myself. And as I said, piecing is not my thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of piecing in a quilt like that too. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll, after Christmas, if I can, uh, Add some money together, I'll just send it out there to be done. Mm -hmm. But they've done very nice work. Mm -hmm. And she parcels it out and charges a little like a fee for her mm -hmm. being the middle person. Mm -hmm. And they do, they do nice work. Apparently that's unusual. Didn't Marie Gensler, Gensner at uh, the investment ceremony say something about that? She had some quilts there and said that she had made that one in particular when she was very young mm -hmm. or just married or something mm -hmm. and a woman quilted it for her mm -hmm. for $12 or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There was a group of women in uh, Pine Hill that yeah. used to do, I don't know if they're still doing it, mm -hmm. but they did, They quilted a quilt. When we finished the Bicentennial quilt and had our first quilt show, I think, we made a, uh, an album quilt for Ruth mm -hmm. and we had it quilted by the ladies out oh, there. Nice. Oh, yeah, she showed it to me. It's on her bed. Right. 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 It was really beautiful. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. um, yeah, oh, there, there's still, you have to hunt around. And I understand in, in Pennsylvania Dutch country, there's still a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of groups that, uh, that will do it, too. Mm -hmm. You just have to make the contact, you know, once you have the contact person. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm out of questions. <laughs> what did I forget to ask? I don't know. I don't know. I'm a little ill prepared for this one. Um, How long have you been in Kingston? Twelve years. Mm -hmm. It'll be twelve years now. Well, it's eleven and a half now. A mm -hmm. um, couple of things I might just fill in, you know. Um, in retrospect, Um, and that this could be looked upon as good and bad. But the most, maybe this is just coincidental, I don't know how to put this. What I'm trying to say is that when my marriage was falling apart and there were really difficult times, mm -hmm. uh, the quilting really meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And I see it now as maybe one of the things that was helping me keep it all together, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the other little side story I might tell you is that, let's see, when I took my first quilting class, I was pregnant with my second son. Mm -hmm. And that class like ended in November, December, and then Ruth, and Ruth was approaching people at that time, would you like to work on a bicentennial quilt? Because mm -hmm. he was born in January 75, mm -hmm. and I took the course in the fall of 74. Mm -hmm. So, and, and because I didn't know anybody in Kingston, Ruth was, became not only my teacher, but a close friend. Mm -hmm. And she had older kids, and I was having babies, and it's so nice to talk to women who have raised kids or mm -hmm. have kids much older than yours because it gives you so much perspective. And she had a lot of very wise things to 
say mm -hmm. um, that I needed to hear. And uh, so after I had Matthew, January 25th, about a month overdue, she called me and she said, we're having our first organizing meeting. Do you think that you'd be able to come? And I said, oh, gee, I don't know. At night, new baby. I was nursing him. I had had a cesarean infection. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't think so. I don't want to have to pass this one up. <laughs> came the night for the meeting. Yeah. And my husband came home and I said, oh, and it's windy, it's cold, yeah. it's February. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to go. And I went <laughs> with the baby to the meeting, ran through the parking lot because it was so uh, windy and cold went upstairs to the lounge at the community college, sat in the chair and thought I was going to pass out. Yeah. Because I really, I had not put myself through that intense physical exertion of getting, bundling the baby, getting out of the car and running and then going up the stairs. And I thought my back was going to open up. Yeah. You know, not my incision. Yeah. But I felt it in my back and I felt, woo. Yeah. And fortunately, I, did, I was in a chair as this feeling overcame me <laughs> right. and it passed. Uh -huh. But that's how much I wanted. <laughs> really? I wanted to be there. I could. I said, no, I want to be in on the beginning of this project, uh -huh. you know. So uh, mm -hmm. um, it was. It it would it will be a memorable evening in my mind uh -huh. <laughs> for the uh -huh. rest of my life because of that. It's funny when you are having children, you associate. Well, I was pregnant for this one. Yeah. Did this. <laughs> or um, the a lot of the ladies that worked on that quilt gave me a baby shower when I was pregnant for the next baby. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And he was born in June of 77. And we were planning for the 1978, our first big show at the college. But we didn't have a guild yet, a formal guild. And it was at my shower where a number of things were discussed. Oh, great about what uh -huh. the name of the guild would be uh -huh. and, um, you know, organization-wise and uh -huh. a lot of the preliminary yakking about uh -huh. a formal group. Uh -huh. And we all decided we really can't, we first will take care of the show and yeah. then we'll, you know, move on to this organization, but we all agreed we needed the organization. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was just like yesterday to me and it's related, you know, and memorable because yeah. of the connection. Now, do you get to quilt with them, with the guild, very often? Uh, how many people are in the Austin Town Guild? The guild? Oh, I, now, I don't know, 120, 150 members. We have been 180. Now, how do you manage to have, do you work on pro specific no, projects? No, no. Well, yeah. no. The only group mm -hmm. project that we do is, um, in terms of producing quilts, is that we make a raffle quilt. That's okay. raffled in conjunction with each show. Okay, I see. And so that's our only quilting bee time. Mm -hmm. That that quilt goes from place to place, and ladies will come to that particular okay. house and quilt around that quilt. Okay. They are superb yeah. quilts. Really, have been prize winners. Mm -hmm. And how do you decide between 120 people on the design? No, we don't. Oh. A group does. Okay. We we nominate. You know, these five people are okay. going to usually. You don't get. 25 people clamoring to be involved in oh. this because it's a lot of work and yeah. it's a responsibility because they have to decide on the design, pick the fabrics and the colors. Okay. But we know who's good mm -hmm. at color and we just say do it right. because we know, we trust their work, we trust their sense and it's usually a group of people who work together and mm -hmm. they'll plan the design and and then another group that's really good at piecing will piece and then, mm -hmm. then we get it in the frame and we quilt. Mm -hmm. Um, the 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 big project, of course, is putting on the show, and we we provide the manpower for that. Right. Aside from most of the exhibits, we provide the manpower for the show, which is no small task. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sure in your professional experience, you've probably been involved. I've, I've only hung one quilt show, okay. and I can't but say it was But a photographic well exhibit, a quilt show, <laughs> anything for the public, anything yeah. with and tickets and Publicity right. oh, and yeah. advanced sales and uh, uh, the hoi polloi with coming, the right people getting them there, and the, the 
Right. You know, I mean, you've done one and you know where the problems are uh -huh. or the work areas. Mm -hmm. So that's a good job. But we meet uh, alternating months on a Saturday uh -huh. at the college in uh -huh. a big space. And we'll have small workshops or we'll have an outside speaker that does a group presentation. We do different things. So mm -hmm. we're educating ourselves all the time, mm -hmm. either with our own local talent or with outside people that we pay to come. Mm -hmm. uh, this is quite a network of people. And, on, and in between months, there's a night meeting. Mm -hmm. And, oh my, I'm just tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there may be something tonight that I'm supposed to go to. Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> there is. And I wanted to stay home so bad. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, there is. Never a dull moment. It's an executive board meeting of the Quilters Guild. Uh huh. Um, so those night meetings are to meet the needs of people who can't come during the day or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, and, and uh, we do more or less the same thing. We have encouraged all along that small cluster groups form. Mm -hmm. Some, you see, some guilds didn't, we kind of grew backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, some guilds have been formed by different groups, small groups, who band together and form the guild. The small groups remain chapters. Okay. And the guild uh, is a large organization. We started the guild first and wanted to encourage chapters, and uh -huh. it's never quite worked. Uh -huh. But we, the South Mountain Peacemakers, to which Marie Gensner belongs, is the first really successful chapter. Okay. Um, we should have more of that because they're the the woman to woman camaraderie. The the uh, the rewards of the social part, mm -hmm. and I say that in a very positive sense of social, mm -hmm. that quilting can offer as a group experience, mm -hmm. you can't find in a group of 180 women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're not going to find out that this person has the potential to be a great friend of yours right. at a meeting of that size. But in a small group of 10 women that meet together over a period of time on a regular basis, that can truly be your women's support group, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. if you're fortunate. Mm -hmm. you know. So um, the chapters are the way to, are the way to go. <coughs> so the guild you know, really has done, in manning the shows and in keeping the interest in the art form uh, going, uh, has done a, a, a great job. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this is a, a resurgence only in the past 10 or 15 years? Yeah, um, there's kind of a high a watermark for this. I, I, get, I guess around the 70s, in yeah. the early 70s, um, there was a big exhibit mm -hmm. at the uh, where are the museums in New York? In New York? Mm -hmm. There was a big exhibit in New York, and from that exhibit, it, it just began yeah. to, to uh, swell. And then, of course, the bicentennial helped, yeah. just as the centennial had. Mm -hmm. I think in terms <coughs> of mm -hmm. the fadiness of interest in things, it's probably peaked. Yeah. Okay. But um, it's touched enough people for it to ensure that it might slow down in another tw 20, mm -hmm. but there'll be more heirloom quilts in 50 years because <laughs> we're making them now, you right. know. So it's kind of ensured the survival of these right. mm -hmm. and continuance mm -hmm. of the, the art form. Mm -hmm. um, who can like say? Land. Who can say? You know, <coughs> it's just it's a lot, a lot of fun. Just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And of course, it doesn't appeal to everybody. Yeah. Do you use a, a lap hoop 
for you. I made first my first two quilts <coughs> on a, I quilted them on a big frame. Uh -huh. At home. At home. And that's very it's cumbersome. It takes a lot of space. I don't have big rooms in this house, and it was a bit, it was hard. Uh -huh. um, then, see, we were all learning too. You know, we were all looking. This was uh, 1975, mm -hmm. and uh, there still were not a lot of um, a lot of cotton. Still weren't available. Uh, the quilting know-how it had kind of been lost. <coughs> you know, mm -hmm. so I remember that one of our members decided that she was going to do a quilt in a lap hoop. Uh -huh. And I saw her result, and I said, well, Elaine, if you can do it in a lap hoop, I said, doesn't it shift? Doesn't it move? How did you keep all the layers? She said, if you waste the hell out of it, yeah, it's not going to move. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, and Elaine is this particular gal. Elaine Blythe is superb. <coughs> and would you like a glass of water? That would be wonderful. Um, so, I'm cold. I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then these lap hoops were developed that we have, the 14-inch hoops that are on little legs on a platform, so that yeah. you don't have to okay. hold the hoops. Yes, yes. Okay? And Charlie called and started making them. And I haven't quilted in a frame. Except for oh. the bicentennial, uh, except for the raffle quilts that we did since then. Let me see if I can find the <coughs> Also, when I, you know, what I tend to do when I want to make a new quilt. I find myself once again pouring through the books of the old quilts that I oh, have, really? and just saying, and I, this is what I advise the students, look through, look at all the quilts you can, and when you come across one that you really like, figure out why you like it. Oh, uh -huh. Is it because of the pattern, the geometrics? Is it because of the color selection? Mm -hmm. What? what makes it one that really bounces out at you. Then from there you go on to decide, you know, what uh -huh. what it is you want to make. Okay. It's almost like deciding on a research topic, in my experience. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, yeah. What mm -hmm. is it about that that's interesting? I don't, you know, I always liked that when I was doing uh, uh, research papers. Uh -huh. I enjoyed 